So our first speaker is uh, Laura Cope. So Laura did a BA at Cambridge, and then she spent a few years doing sensible things, not in academia. And then she came to Leeds to do a, a master's uh, in mathematics. And then she took a step back down, back to, back to Cambridge, uh, where she did a PhD, uh, supervised by Peter Haynes. And in 2018, she was a, a GFD fellow at the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute. Uh, supervised by Pascal Garot and, and Colm Caulfield and I think she's going to tell us about the work she did there and she's going to be talking today about the dynamics of stratified horizontal shear flows. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, before I begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organisers for the invitation to speak today. Um, it really is a pleasure to give this talk. So yes, um, I'm Laura Cope and today I'm going to talk about a project that started whilst I was a fellow at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute's GFD programme in 2018, where I had the opportunity to work with Pascal Gavel and Colin Caulfield. And we were looking at the dynamics of stratified horizontal shear flows within the context of stellar interiors. So what do I mean by stratified or rather stably stratified flows? Well, this simply means that there is a background density gradient such that lighter fluid overlays denser fluid. And by low Pepe number in the title, as I will explain later, I'm simply referring to the fact that these flows are strongly thermally diffusive such that any density perturbations away from the background state um, will diffuse away very rapidly compared with, for example, the diffusivity of momentum. Okay, so um, stratified shear flows naturally exist in a variety of geophysical and astrophysical flows. In the geophysical context, um, the Prancel number which is defined to be the ratio of the diffusivity of momentum to that of heat is approximately of order one. And examples of horizontal shear flows uh, include jet streams in planetary atmospheres and oceans, um, along with rivers and estuaries on smaller scales. On the other hand, in astrophysical flows, um, the Prancel number is much smaller than one since heat diffuses much more rapidly than momentum, and this gives rise to different dynamics. If we take a look at the interior of the sun, it can be broken down into two main regions. So these include an outer convective region that's differentially rotating, faster at the equator with a rotation rate of about 35 days, than at the poles, where the rotation rate is about uh, 25 days. And we also have an inner radiative zone, which to a first approximation behaves like solid body rotation. And then between these zones, we have a thin transition layer that's called the solar tachycline. And this is believed to play an important role in the evolution of stars. And this tachycline is characterized by strong density stratification, along with both vertical shear and horizontal shear um, due to the differential rotation. So the interaction of stratification and shear can lead to instabilities and turbulence, uh, and this in turn can affect the transport properties of the fluid. Now in the geophysical context, um, the key to understanding this transition is through density layering. And by this, um, I mean the formation of well mixed layers of fluid with weak uh, vertical density gradients. And these are separated by sharp interfaces that are associated with much stronger gradients. Now, the reduced stratification between the layers um, enables the onset of instabilities. Um, and hence the development of turbulence. And for horizontal shear flows, um, this can give rise to spectacular layering patterns, um, such as those that you can see in this figure here, um, from this paper by Lucas et al in 2017. 
On the other hand, um, density layers can't develop in the limits um, of strong thermal diffusion in astrophysical flows, since any density perturbations away from the background state will rapidly diffuse away. Um, for vertical shears, it's been shown, um, for example, by um, Garot et al. in 2015, that shear instabilities are suppressed um, provided you have sufficiently strong stratification. So this rules out any possible transition to turbulence um, in this regime. Now, going back to the example of the solar tucker climb, um, there is growing observational evidence that turbulent mixing is present and that this does affect the life cycle of stars. And it's believed that shear instabilities provide one such source of this mixing. So since vertical shear instabilities are eliminated um, when the stratification is sufficiently strong, then combining these ideas um, in this talk, um, I'm aiming to answer the following question. So what dynamical regimes exist in stratified horizontal shear flows in the limits of strong thermal diffusion? Okay, so to answer this question, um, we're going to consider the simplest possible model. So we're going to neglect the effects of rotation and magnetism, and we're going to consider a background state with a linearly varying um, stratification that's imposed on the temperature profile. And we're going to continuously apply a sinusoidal um, horizontal body force to generate horizontal shear. And for simplicity, um, we'll also impose triply periodic boundary conditions. And just to clarify, in the context of the temperature field, um, this periodicity is applied to the perturbations away from the background state. So within this model, and after non-dimensionalizing, um, it turns out that there are three key parameters. So these include the Reynolds number, which I'll show in red, the buoyancy parameter in blue, and the Prancel number in green. And the governing equations can be written as shown at the bottom of this slide here for the three-dimensional velocity field U and temperature perturbations T primed away from the background state. And it's worth mentioning at this point that the product of the Reynolds number and the Prancel number is often referred to as the Peclet number, which I'll show in purple. And so the equations can alternatively be written in terms of the Peclet number. Okay, so um, in this talk, um, we're going to be considering the limit of small Peclet number. And to assist us with our analysis, um, we're going to make use of a convenient approximation that was originally considered by Linier in 1999. And this is called the low Peclet number approximation. In the asymptotic limit of small Peclet number, the temperature equation reduces to a dominant balance between the vertical velocity field, W, and the temperature perturbations, T primed. And this means that the vertical velocity field is slaved to the temperature perturbations. And this enables us to simplify the original equations into a reduced set of equations that are known as the low Peclet number equations, shown at the bottom of the slide. Um, and in this set of equations, we've reduced the number of variables by one by eliminating the temperature field. And this reduced system is now governed by two control parameters. So we have the Reynolds number and we have the product of the buoyancy parameter B times the Peclet number. So this is BPE. Okay, so um, to begin our analysis, uh, we're going to consider the linear stability of the low Peclet number equations about the laminar background state, um, i.e. this sinusoidally varying velocity profile. And in the usual fashion, um, we're going to consider normal mode perturbations 
away from the laminar solution, um, where Q represents a dynamical variable, such as a component of the velocity field. And these perturbations um, have streamwise wave numbers um, given by Kx, vertical wave numbers given by Kz, and their growth rates are given by sigma. And if we substitute these perturbations into the equations of motion, then we can derive an eigenvalue problem for the growth rates sigma, uh, and we can solve this problem numerically. Now, we're going to focus to begin with on the 2D modes, um, and these are vertically invariant, where kz is equal to zero. And then we can consider how the stability of these modes varies with Reynolds number and streamwise wave number kx. And the neutral stability uh, curve for these 2D modes, oops, sorry, uh, for these 2D modes, uh, given here, uh, to, uh, which is where sigma is equal to zero, is shown in the centre of the slide, and instability is found below and to the right of this curve. And this shows that all Reynolds numbers that are greater than or equal to order one are unstable to this 2D mode. And this is in fact true for all combinations of parameters, not just the single example shown here. Um, next, we can consider the neutral stability curves for the 3D modes, um, where Kz is greater than zero. And these are shown on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, and they're plotted in colour. And once again, um, instability occurs to the right and below these curves. However, the important point is that these modes are unstable for a finite value of BPE. So this gives the first key result in the talk, which is that 3D modes are unstable in the limits of strong stratification and strong thermal diffusion, um, where BPE is finite. And this is in contrast to the case of um, vertically sheared flows. Okay, so thinking beyond the initial linear instability, um, we've studied the subsequent nonlinear evolution using direct numerical simulations, or DNSs, that solve both the standard, um, i.e. the full, and the low Peckley number equations. And we've simulated um, varying different combinations of parameters across 65 different simulations in total, um, focusing on the regime where we have a low Peckley number. And in each case, we observe the initial instability of 2D modes, which cause a meandering of the background flow. And this is rapidly followed um, by 3D modes, which cause um, a sort of vertical modulation um, of the position of these meanders. And these modes grow in amplitude, and ultimately this growth creates layers in the velocity field um, that give rise to strong vertical shear between the layers. Uh, and this shear allows for the development um, of vertical shear instabilities, and hence the onset of turbulence. And this is the second key point um, in this talk today. And it's also useful and interesting to mention that as BPE increases, um, the vertical scale of these 3D modes um, decreases. So what happens next um, depends on the parameters. Once the system reaches an equilibrium, we observe at least four different dynamical regimes that depend on the value of BPE for a given Reynolds number. And these are illustrated on this slide um, using snapshots of the streamwise velocity field, U, along the top of the slide, and the vertical velocity field W um, along the bottom. So moving from left to right, when BPE is very small, the system is essentially unstratified and it's dominated by large scale isotropic eddies that are comparable with the size of the domain. As BPE begins to increase, um, we enter a stratified turbulence regime that's characterized by layers of large-scale meandering jets 
but are visible in the streamwise velocity fields. And these jets are accompanied by small scale isotropic eddies that you can see in the vertical velocity fields. And then as the stratification and hence BPE further increases, um, these layers in the streamwise velocity fields become more pronounced and their vertical scales become smaller. And the turbulence becomes intermittent, as you can see in this snapshot here. And then finally, for the largest values of BPE, um, the vertical length scales become sufficiently small um, so that viscosity dominates the dynamics. OK, so um, these four regimes are associated with various different scalings um, that can be empirically deduced from the data. And in the interests of time today, we're going to focus on this talk um, on the yellow stratified turbulence regime, where we observe a clear relationship for the vertical eddy length scales, um, LZ, which are found to scale as BPE to the minus a third. So we've also investigated the mixing efficiency, um, eta, which um, we define to be the efficiency um, with which kinetic energy that's produced by the forcing is converted into potential energy. And to be more specific, um, this can be derived from the momentum equation. So if we dot the momentum equation with u and integrate over the domain, we derive the equation for the evolution of the energy. And then in a state of equilibrium, we have a balance between the temperature flux or this vertical buoyancy flux, dissipation, and the energy injections due to the forcing. And then the mixing efficiency is defined to be the fraction of energy that's converted into potential energy, i.e. this buoyancy flux, rather than being dissipated. So in the stratified turbulence regime, um, our simulations show that the mixing efficiency is approximately constant, given by this yellow line here. And it's equal to about 0 0.4. And then it drops off significantly um, as BPE increases and we enter the intermittent regime. And then finally, um, the root mean square vertical velocity field, W, um, is found to scale as BPE to the minus a sixth. So these scalings um, can also be derived theoretically by considering dominant balances um, in the governing equations. And once again, um, we'll focus just on the stratified turbulence regime. So we'll begin by assuming that the magnitude of the horizontal velocity field is of order one. And this is motivated by the snapshots for U. And we'll also assume that the small scale eddies visible, for example, here, are isotropic. If we combine the low Peclet number approximation that was shown earlier with a balance in the vertical momentum equation between inertia and stratification, since we're going to assume that viscosity is negligible in this regime, then we can derive the same scalings that we empirically deduced um, from the DNS data. And in fact, a similar analysis can be performed um, for the scalings in the other regimes as well. So this is reassuring, and this leads to our final result in which we're able to deduce a scaling for the vertical turbulent diffusivity, which I'll call D-turb, um, by combining the vertical velocity field W with the vertical eddy length scales LZ um, to give a scaling of BPE to the minus a half. Okay, so to conclude, um, we've discussed stratified horizontal shear instabilities in the astrophysically relevant limit of strong thermal diffusion or small Peclet number. And from linear stability theory, we found that 3D modes are always unstable in this limit, even for very strongly stratified flows. And these 3D modes 
grow in amplitude, um, generating layers and hence vertical shear, um, which in turn allow for the onset of vertical shear instabilities. The resulting nonlinear evolution um, revealed at least four distinct regimes which depended on the value of BPE um, for any given Reynolds number. And then finally, um, scalings for these regimes were deduced both theoretically and empirically, where we noted that the stratified turbulence regime um, was characterized by a constant mixing efficiency equal to about 0 0.4 and a vertical turbulent diffusivity that scales as BPE to the minus a half. Um, thanks very much for your attention today, and I'd be delighted to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Laura. That was a very nice, very clear talk. Uh, so we do have time for some questions. And please, if you have some questions, just type them into the chat. We have one in there already from Kishore Dutta, which says, could you kindly elaborate why the layered anisotropic stratified turbulence last regime cannot occur at low Prandtl number? Or can it? Um, so at low Prandtl number, um, or sort of equivalently low Perkley number, essentially um, for layering, you're going to need, um, on average, um, the, the background density profile is, need to, is going to need to become well mixed um, in order that you get these regions of weak density gradients separated by stronger um, gradients in the interfaces. When you've got um, strong thermal diffusivity, then any um, grade, uh, any perturbations away from the background state are going to diffuse away um, very rapidly. And so you're not going to be able to maintain those layers. Okay, thank you. Um, whilst other people type in their questions, I have a, oh, okay, no, there's a, there's a one from Juno Park here. Uh, which says, thanks for the nice talk. I suppose for fixed Reynolds number, Peclet number B and B, the 2D modes are, however, more unstable than the 3D modes in the linear stability computation. I was wondering in the nonlinear simulations why the 3D modes become more dominant. That's a really good question. We noticed that, um, I mean, I didn't show the figures in this talk, um, but the, the details are provided in the paper on the final slide here. But um, we notice that the 2D mode does become unstable first, and then that is rapidly followed by the 3D modes. Um, why the 3D modes become dominant, I'm not too sure, but I presume it, it could be sort of some sort of like secondary instability that's taking place, like an instability of the, the 2D mode itself. But I would, I think some like further work would be required to confirm that. So do you start with a random perturbation? Is that how yeah. you start? Yeah, again? random perturbations to the temperature field, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, so there's a very similar question from Dwight, uh, which says, if 3D modes are unstable for Reynolds numbers above those for 2D instabilities, is the 3D analysis still relevant? Meaning, wouldn't one want to do the analysis of the 2D uh, uh, equilibrium, the resulting 2D flow? Yeah, thanks, Laura. That's a good question. It's something that I need to think about, I think. But yeah, that's a really interesting question. Okay, and uh, I guess a final question. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. How do you think the obtained scaling laws will change in the case of a wall-bounded stratified turbulent shear flow, if there might be any? Ah, okay. Um, Again, I mean, it's an interesting question. It's something that I, I really don't know because I was looking in this um, study at um, periodic boundary conditions. Um, I probably wouldn't like to hazard a guess, to be honest. Um, so I'm not too sure at the moment. Okay, you're not sticking your neck out. <laughs> no. Okay.